Well, I guess you all know who I am. I just stood here awkwardly for like 10, 10 plus minutes. Um, I'm the tech lead with Autark. Uh, now I'm going to go over the more general Aragon system, Aragon SDK. It's basically all of the uh, main tools that people are using to develop on the Aragon network currently. Uh, the interesting thing about this perspective of this presentation, you might have heard um, sort of how these tools work together independently, or the uh, A1 team, the initial team's perspective on how these tools have been developed and how they're being leveraged. Um, but this is the perspective um, that I sort of gained out of the uh <coughs> planning suite process. So I'm going to try and give an overview of what I see as the initial entry points into the Aragon SDK system. Um, I'm going to touch on each of the individual components, but I'm going to give a special attention to the Aragon JS, the Aragon CLI. These are the main two repos, or the main two aspects of the Aragon SDK that most people will use initially. And then as they get more familiar with those, they can dig deeper into the different components. Where do I point it? There we go. All right, so um, again, the reason that I'm sort of qualified to give this overview is I was one of the um, first people outside of Aragon 1 to try and build some of these more complex applications. Uh, when we first started to try and build out the full planning suite, as I think might have come up very briefly, we were initially um, that planning tab. We had a single application approach to this whole thing. Um, and then as we became more familiar with some of the limitations and um, intricacies of the Aragon SDK, we decided to split that out into multiple applications. Um, now going forward, we sort of have the perspective uh, within Autark of trying to give the initial user experience that we had mapped out for the planning tab um, the ability to live um, with the code that we've, we've developed. So some of the more opinion-based things within this presentation are uh, attempting to accomplish that. So the context that I'm trying to establish with this presentation is um, for either people who have never used an Aragon application, never developed an Aragon application, or non-technical users who want to know whether or not the Aragon SDK is a fit, um, and what sort of assumptions are made within the Aragon SDK compared to other possible solutions. Again, also, I'll, I'll give a brief um, overview of everything, and then at the end, I'll pepper in my opinions. So uh, I guess what are you know what are the what are what's the main goal of the Aragon SDK and what um, where does it start making its attempts to accomplish uh, this sort of like uh, approach to a governance toolkit um, at the Aragon OS level, uh, which is sort of like the the base level or the the bottom level of the whole stack. Um, there's three main things that it's trying to provide: it's forwarding, uh, a complex permission system and upgradability. And those, those three things sort of <coughs> work together um, to create the Aragon SDK. So when we, we start from those three pillars and then we build up, there's other problems that we sort of have to solve um, with different repositories and different tools. So once we have those three pillars established, uh, we need a way to connect contracts to front-end assets in a completely decentralized way, which is sort of where Aragon uh, project management comes in. And then we also need a way to um, handle state and interact with state without having any sort of centralized servers. And that's one of the main things that Aragon, S uh, Aragon API, and specifically Aragon JS, which is the first implementation uh, of that, tries to solve. Um, we also need to be able to set up an environment in an easy way. This is a really complex development environment that we, we start to get ourselves into with all of these different tools working together. Uh, and we want to make sure that a developer is able to get a test environment up and set up with basically one command. Uh, so that, again, introduces uh, more challenges. And again, this is a challenge that we've come to from all of these other complex uh, features that we've tried to uh, provide. <coughs> So this isn't really accurate in, in a technical um, way. You know, everything isn't directly tied into Aragon OS, but a lot of the uh, features and design decisions resolve, revolve around the fact that this is sort of at the center of the ecosystem or the center of the, the SDK. Um, it, it still actually is more of a, a stack. Um, and as we go through each of the individual components, we'll try and do that more in the, the, the layer um, order so that you can see how they layer up. 
But the important thing is to note that uh, we start with those sort of first three features that we get out of Aragon OS, and then all of the other things and the, all of the other things that we're trying to accomplish sort of uh, branch out of this. So again, Aragon OS. Um, for developers, this is probably one of the pieces that you'll actually need to interact with um, the least in terms of things that you're modifying, whether or not you need a reference to this. Uh, there's basically, again, there's the three, the three things that you're getting out of Aragon OS, and the two that require the most configuration are the permissions, um, which are really easy to set. It's not much harder than doing like a require guard or a modifier uh, with regular solidity. Um, so as long as you, well, whether or not you're familiar with solidity, if you are, it's not too hard to uh, handle. And then there's the idea of forwarding. If you want to create your own forwarder, um, instead of just using something like voting, which is a forwarder within the Aragon OS system, um, then that requires a little bit more configuration. But for the most part, you're not really going to have to change much or interact with Aragon OS beyond what you can do through the existing tools. <coughs> Again, Aragon PM, this is probably the part that the average developer building an Aragon application needs to uh, understand the least. <laughs> I don't want to say that because I don't want to give anybody like a reason not to learn something, but realistically, it's probably the part that you'll um, have to touch the least. The main thing that this is going to do for you as a developer is give you a logical way to um, link your IPFS content uh, to a human-readable name and contracts. Um, it can obviously do a lot more than that, but the main thing that you need to worry about is, as a starting developer or an organization dealing with these tools is that it, it lets you do that. It lets you link contracts to um, uh, off, uh, well, decentralized assets that aren't on, on chain. <coughs> now we start to get into the parts that uh, a first time developer or somebody that's um, trying to understand whether or not the SDK is a good fit need to start understanding. So this is basically the uh, library or toolkit that developers will probably have the most um, interaction with. Uh, this is what's going to handle most of your state. It's the reason that you really don't need to w worry about Web3 at all within an Aragon project. Um, it, it lets you just sort of um, deal with the Aragon SDK and get it to do things with little more than a basic understanding of JavaScript. Um, this, this is only one implementation of the Aragon API. Uh, it is possible that there'll be other implementations so that people don't need to use JavaScript. Um, right now, most people, uh, most of the applications are leveraging Aragon JS client side. They're not putting it into some sort of intermediate server or anything. Um, so it does let you handle state completely client side, which is nice. Um, it it lets again lets you focus on uh, making sure that your applications truly are decentralized in that way. But it can be used. You could use this on a server. It's just I haven't seen anybody do it. So this is the probably like if there's one thing that I can get you to do out of this presentation, as if you're a non-technical user or you're a developer that's never touched anything, just download the, the command line tool and play around with organizations. Um, this is probably the first thing that people should be downloading when they're first trying to interact with the SDK. Um, it has the ability to scaffold a project initially. It has the ability for power to let power users direct interact directly with DAOs, whether that's on some sort of test net, whether that's on main net, whether that's on a local local uh, test net, anything like that. Um, there's a lot of new features that have been added to the CLI. Uh, the recently created uh, Aragon co-op was created using um, methods that were modified and added to the, the CLI. So this is this is a really great tool. Here's just a quick overview of some of the uh, main features that it offers. Uh, there's more features than this, but if, you, if you're at least a brief overview, this shows you some of the most powerful things it can do and sort of the order that you would um, want to approach them. Again, you can scaffold something initially. You can get, get yourself a code base to start building off of. You can initialize a DAO, and then you can start adding applications to it. So if you want to try and create some sort of weird DAO that you can't do out of uh, the, the currently deployed uh, Aragon templates, this is the way that you're going to want to do it. Basically, with these three commands, you can just build anything that 
you could do with any combination of the currently existing applications. And as more applications start to exist, the number of like sort of custom and weird homebrew DAOs that you can create is just going to increase, which is great. Then you also have some features for per permission management um, and the ability, again, to give us that developer environment with one command that we really want. Um, the, the more time a developer has to spend uh, trying to figure out how to establish their test environment, um, the, the more friction that creates. And we don't want that. We don't want people stuck in this place where they're spending all of their time getting their environment set up, because that's awful. You just want to write code, right? <coughs> and then there's Aragon UI. Um, I'm not going to go over this a ton, because hopefully you all saw the LoriKit uh, presentation. And that sort of gave you an understanding of the direction that Aragon UI is going in, uh, as that's more, a, a more of a generalized take on what Aragon UI does. Uh, but personally, I love having this at, at our disposal, just because it lets us basically not worry about styling at all. <laughs> um, we can just you know, build stuff. Most of the components that we need are in this um, toolkit. So we just grab whatever we need and plug it in. So now I'll start peppering in my opinions. Um, I think it's fair to assume that we want, at least at the contract level, to build relatively small, simple contracts that fill a lot of different purposes. Um, a lot of the approaches to designing applications take this into account within the Aragon system. But the problem is that if you carry this over to the uh, full application development cycle, you get into situations where your user experience isn't super intuitive because you have all of these super generalized pieces that you've created based on the contracts that you start with um, that force the user to cycle through multiple applications to get what they may perceive as a single action done. So. Uh, going forward with the Aragon SDK, one of the things that's really important to me is to make the development cycle uh, easier when we're making the decision um, for how we tie the front ends into these super generalized and simple contracts that we have. Uh, so it might make sense to start with a single application that gives us the functionality of that contract and lets us in install it into a DAO. But over time, if you start to see these sort of bundled applications exist within organizations, we want organizations to understand that they should modify the user uh, interface assets that they're serving to people based on the combinations. So to me, that's something that's important to try and drive towards in development. <coughs> So uh, yeah, again, another thing. Um, the CLI hopefully will be sort of broken down a little bit. Uh, what it was initially designed to do, just serve developers that test environment, is uh, a lot less than it does now. So we expect the CLI to be sort of broken down into smaller pieces. Um, and in addition to that, as I mentioned, uh, Aragon.js is just one implementation of the Aragon API. So a sort of a fun project that somebody could approach is to try and give an alternative implementation of that. Um, the, the use cases for that could be th things like, um, you know, if we did want to have uh, something similar to Aragon.js, an implementation of the API existing on a uh, server, it's probably uh, w might be better off not being JavaScript. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully I've convinced you to at least install the CLI or give some of this stuff a try. Uh, if you want a resource for learning some of this, uh, getting, getting your hands dirty a little bit more, hack.aragon.org just got an update. So there's great tutorials, um, decent documentation. We're trying to improve it every day, right? And then if you have any questions, obviously join the chat, find, find people on DevHelp, or you can contact me. All right, that's it. <coughs>